Hello, I'm John Perry, and welcome to Representative Gary Glenn Reports with Representative Gary Glenn. John, Representative, good to, good to see you. Boy, there is a lot to talk about today, the passage of the House Roads Package, the budget. We're going to talk about uh, adoption legislation as well as some things going on in your district. Starting off with Representative, uh, just about 24 hours ago as we record this now, House lawmakers did in fact approve the 12-bill House Roads Package. Maybe to start off with, it is worth noting that as it stands right now, this is the only roads package out there. Well, and it's past the House. As, as Speaker of the House, Kevin Cotter, who's my seatmate, uh, covers, uh, I think, about two-thirds of Midland County geographically. As he said in his comments on the House floor, if you don't like our plan, where's yours? We haven't seen a plan from the Senate. We haven't seen a plan from Governor Snyder. So one thing I can say with uh, some degree of pride in our caucus is we didn't sit around and wait on somebody else to be leaders on this issue. I think the message from voters was heard loud and clear. In my district, it was an 85% vote against Proposal 1, which was going to be the biggest tax increase in half a century, most of our lifetimes. Uh, and people, uh, I thought, were pretty clear. And I, uh, I find it curious, and, and I resist the strain to read every message out of an 85% vote against the biggest tax increase in 50 years as meaning everything except don't raise my taxes. So while I commend the Speaker of the House for coming up with a plan, and I stood with him at the news conference to announce it, first thing he said was it doesn't necessarily mean every member standing here is in favor of every element, but I stood with him on the plan because it's a billion dollar spending package on roads and bridges out of existing state revenue. And about 98% of the proposal is finding the money in our state budget to fix roads and bridges, which is supposedly one of our priorities. It had about 2% uh, increase in taxes. I voted for all of the elements of the bill that reallocated the, the billion dollars to fix our roads and bridges consistent with my promise to the people of Bay and Midland Counties as a candidate for this position. I voted against the three bills that increased taxes uh, and will continue to maintain that posture. But what it said to me was, out of a billion dollar package, we were only $30 million in tax increases away from being able to demonstrate that the House Republican Caucus could spend a billion dollars in current revenue on roads and bridges without raising taxes at all. Uh, who knows where the, the uh, spending package will eventually end up in negotiation with the governor and the senator, but at least the House came up with something, and we've already passed it. So now the onus of responsibility is on the other House and on the governor to respond to that package, to make a proposal of their own. Um, I, I was happy to uh, support the elements of the package that reallocated spending toward what we claim to be one of our priorities, fixing roads and bridges but also uh, took satisfaction, frankly, in upholding my word to the people of my district that I was not going to raise their taxes. I told them last year on 9,000 doors, you know why, you know, when I'm in Lansing next year and they pressure me to raise taxes, I'm going to tell them I told you here at the door some 9,000 times I'm not going to do it. And that is my intention. I refuse to become a political cliche. You know, the guy who runs for office promising not to raise taxes, first thing he does for six months, he gets to Lansing, he votes, turns around votes to raise taxes. I simply refuse to do that. Uh, but nonetheless, we've started the process, and uh, we are also going to be prepared to meet throughout the summer. Uh, we have some time scheduled for work in our districts away from Lansing, but, but we are on standby if we need to come and respond to some action by the Senate. So I am uh, pretty confident that by the end of the summer we're going to have a road funding package in its final form. Uh, but once again, I commend Speaker Cotter for his leadership on making sure the House acted without having to wait on anybody else. Because after all, House Republicans did move quickly on this issue within, what, about eight days. Yep. Following the failure of Proposition 1, there was a House Republican package yep. starting to move. Yep, we put that package out uh, within about a week after Proposal 1 was so overwhelmingly rejected. Obviously, it's the members of the House who are going to face re-election, face the voters. We're most accountable and, and most quickly accountable to voters. Uh, and uh, so we're not uh, making any attempt to shirk that responsibility and that accountability. We're, we moved quickly, and now our proposal is on the table. I'm hopeful, as I said throughout the consideration of the process, I maintained a, an anchor-type position in the Republican caucus of being opposed to any tax increase at all, to make sure that the Speaker and other House Republican leadership is not pressured from only one side of the issue by those who want to demand even bigger tax increases. 
so hopefully we'll end up with a plan that, uh, that, that is overwhelmingly based on using existing revenue and does not increase the tax burden on the people and the employers in the state of Michigan. And you know, Representative, this might be an appropriate time to, to lateral over to the budget, which was passed last week, because the 2016 fiscal year budget does include what? An additional $400 million general fund dollars for roads. Right. I mean, we'd, that's for roads regardless of what was in the new road funding package. So we are really taking leadership and putting substantial money into this. If we were to appropriate a billion all at once, it can't all be spent in this construction season. Uh, if that were to happen, you'd have higher bids for construction. It would be inflationary. Uh, so the fact that our current budget that we just approved allocates $400 million more to roads, uh, regardless of what happens with the road funding package, we're on the job. We're, we're approaching this. We're doing it in a responsible fashion. The budget, uh, I, certainly on a comparative basis, is a conservative budget. Uh, there was actually a reduction for the first time in four years of that portion of the budget over which we as legislators have total control. A, a and that's an important point because really you do not have total control over the entire over budget. Over the entire budget. But the part we do have total control over that's discretionary uh, to members of the legislature, spending went down for the first time in four years. The part of the budget, which is simply a federal money pass through, and of course, I'm among those. I'm a taxpayer too. I look at that federal money. I don't say that's just free money. You hear that bandied around. But uh, there's a significant part of the budget that we don't have total control over. It's simply a pass through of federal money. The feds send it to the state, and the state has to allocate it uh, under federal rules and regulations. That went up by about 2%. So the overall uh, calculation then of the part we do control and the part we don't have total control over is a 1.2 percent increase in the budget. By, uh, by most standards, that's a conservative budget. It's less than the, the rate of inflation. In the past, I've been in, uh, active in support of something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, and the standard that that applied to, to state government spending was to say no more than the rate of inflation. So even without that type of policy binding, for example, in our state constitution, this budget was a 1.2% increase, uh, less than the rate of inflation. Now, John, let me make clear, if the budget had reduced spending across the board by 1%, I'd have voted for that too. If it had been 2% reduction across the board, I would have voted for that. So I would have voted for a more conservative budget, but I did vote for this budget. It passed uh, pretty overwhelmingly, I think somewhere in the high 60s, and then the education funding budget 99 or 100 Which votes. is very unusual to see that kind of breakdown. I was told it was historic. It was, uh, that means it was strong bipartisan support for the education funding budget. And let me address that. Uh, I've got about seven school districts in the Bay and, and Midland County area that I represent. And on the low end, and this is something I'm going to continue to do my best to fix, the Midland Public Schools had an increase of only $25 per student. Understandably, folks in the Midland Public School District, our school board, our superintendent, not real thrilled with that. Uh, we did get in the House budget uh, language that would have allocated some of the at-risk money to the Midland Public School System for the first time, and that did not survive the negotiations in conference committee with the state Senate. Uh, Representative Tim Kelly, who's chairman of the K-12 subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, has assured me, because he agrees in principle with me, that he's going to put it back in the budget next year, too, that's going to pass the House again. And he believes, and I, honestly, I don't follow exactly what his reasoning is, but he believes next year we'll be more likely to be able to keep that in the, uh, the final bill that is passed by the House and the Senate so that we would see some significant increase, uh, first time ever, that Midland Public Schools would get any of this at-risk money. About 27 percent of the kids in the middle and public schools are considered at risk, but the money is allocated per district based on the, the threshold of how many of your, what percentage of children are categorized that way. Uh, our position is, as a matter of principle, Jerry Wasserman, the superintendent, uh, Mike uh, Shero, and Jerry being chairman of the school board, is that that money ought to be allocated per child and not by district. As a matter of principle, the House passed that language this year. It didn't get approved by the Senate. We're going to keep going back on that and try and make sure that the Midland District does not continue to find itself on the low end. On the other hand, uh, the, the high end uh, of the range among the school districts that I represent, the Pinconning Public School District got a $219, uh, $219 per pupil increase. 
Now, neither of those figures count hundreds of dollars that we spend to pay off the teacher pension debt, which if the state weren't paying that, the local school districts would have to come up out of their own budget to continue to pay that down. So even in the case of Midland, they got a $25 per student increase in funding on the, the state school aid funding. We also spent, I believe, about $150 additional, even in Midland, on helping pay down their long-term teacher debt. If we didn't make that payment, they'd have to come up with it out of their, their local funds. But I'm going to continue to work with Mike Shero and, uh, and Jerry Wasserman to address that funding question. I support Jerry Wasserman's proposal that maybe with the leadership of Dow Chemical and some other community leaders and other business leaders around the state, that we come up with a Blue Ribbon Commission to rethink in total how we fund our, our, our public schools. Uh, the purpose of Proposal A some 25 years ago was to give property tax relief, but here we are 25 years later still trying to close the gap in funding between school districts such that now you have $25 increase per pupil for Midland, $219 increase for Pinconning. That just isn't, I think, going to be sustainable, doesn't make sense. It, it's not sustainable politically, I don't think. So I'm going to continue to focus on that. Uh, but nonetheless, people in Pinconning, I spoke to their school board on Monday night, uh, and uh, they were very happy with the increase. It's my responsibility to try and, uh, and make sure that that funding is distributed in an equitable basis to school districts all across the district that I represent. Before we go to our break, Representative, we should probably talk about energy policy, too. Earlier in the spring, we chatted about some extensive committee hearings that the, uh, the Energy Committee had back in April. Uh, now we're, uh, we're hearing some pundits in Lansing saying, well, you know, maybe uh, we're going to see, perhaps you could say, the reset button hit in the committee. What's going on there? Well, and I think that's good news. Uh, about two months ago, what uh, lobbyists and my fellow legislators heard from me was we need to slow this train down because I thought we were rushing towards setting policy based on what in retrospect appears to have been bad information. This notion that we have some kind of impending catastrophe and in response to that, that uh, our responsibility was to turn over a 100% monopoly of the energy market to the two, uh, two utilities, uh, DTE and Consumers Energy. And I think as more information has come out, as legislators on the en Energy Committee have learned more, and 17 out of the 25 members of the Energy Committee are new, so we were coming to the issue without a base of knowledge, but the more we've learned, the more that it has become apparent, there is no impending catastrophe. There is no justification for giving two companies monopoly over all electricity uh, generation and sales in the state of Michigan. And you have a proposal the governor laid out in his state of the energy state uh, proposal back in January or February. Uh, Senator Knopfs, the chairman of the Senate Energy Committee, is supposedly going to make some kind of presentation of his plan uh, later this summer. And the House Energy Committee chairman has put forth a plan which would eliminate all electricity choice. Nobody would be able to choose any electricity provider other than consumers or DTE who already have a 90% monopoly. Uh, they told the legislature in 2008 that if they were given a, a guaranteed portion of the market and they got 90%, that they would build new power plants. They were given 90% and they have built no new power plants. Now they're coming back to us and saying, we aren't able to build new power plants unless you give us 100%. I, I mean, they. The burden of proof was on them to demonstrate to me that the principle we know works in all other aspects of our lives, that if you have multiple providers of a good or service or product and the consumer is free to choose, then the multiple providers have to compete against each other and we end up getting the best product at the best price. That was the bias I brought to the position as vice chairman of the Energy Committee and I appreciate uh, Representative Cotter, Speaker Cotter, having entrusted me with that position and I'm trying to take it seriously. But the burden of proof was on those who believe they're in monopoly theory to prove that competition and consumer choice applies to everything else in life. We know it does, but it doesn't apply to electricity. Well, I'm unpersuaded. And in fact, uh, we talked about school funding. Um, you talked about that early on, too. Yeah, one, one of the proposals that I'm going to make as vice chairman of the Energy Committee, and since it appears that the chairman of the Energy Committee's proposal to eliminate all choice in electricity is not going to move forward, I'm going to, over the next couple of months during our uh, in-district work periods in the summer, I'm going to put together a comprehensive free market-based energy reform package of my own. And 
fill that vacuum that I perceive. One of the state capital newsletters just this morning had an article in which they uh, reported that it appeared that the, uh, the House Committee Chairman's proposal to eliminate all choice uh, was in the sleep mode, put on the sleep mode or something to that effect. So it doesn't look like that's going to move. I'm going to try to fill that vacuum uh, and, and provide leadership on the issue with a free market comprehensive reform package. The flagship element of that is going to be to say that all public schools in Michigan should be able to choose the cheapest provider of electricity. Half of the public schools we've learned in Michigan are in that arbitrary 10% cap of the population that's allowed to choose an alternative energy supplier other than consumers or DTE. Their experience is they're saving 20 to 30% on electricity costs. Kalamazoo School District, a million dollars a year. Clarkston, 350,000 a year. Bay City Schools, 200,000 a year in my district. But in Midland County, there's no school district that's in the choice market because they can't be. They didn't get in under the 10% cap. So my proposal is going to be to allow every public school district to access electricity choice and that not count against the 10% cap. And uh, I know that as a first term legislator, I should not count any chickens before they're hatched. But it is my belief that if the vote was held on the House Energy Committee, that that proposal would be overwhelmingly adopted uh, by both the Republican side and the Democratic side. As one of the Democratic legislators said, it's going to be hard for us to vote against public schools. So if we are able to do that for public schools, I'm going to follow that up with a proposal to do that for all higher ed. Saginaw Valley State is on choice, but other schools and universities are not, like Northwood, uh, Delta is not on choice that I'm aware of in my district. So I want to say every K through 12, every higher education institution has access to choice. Then what about the state, all the state buildings and its political subdivisions, our counties and cities and villages and townships, should they not have access to being able to choose and save taxpayers money on electricity costs? Uh, Beaumont Hospital says it would save $3 million, just one hospital in Oakland County. The prison system alone says they would save $3 million a year. What would our military facilities in the state say? Well, what if we let every township, city, county, and state building in the state access some uh, alternative provider at the same kind of savings that the half of public schools are in the choice market now have saved? We'd save taxpayers millions, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and then the transition into the private sector for hospitals, because we sure spend a lot of tax dollars paying for health care. If we can help hospitals save money, then that's saving taxpayers money on the cost of health care. Uh, my end objective would be to demonstrate that choice in electricity is good for the people of Michigan, just like choice in every other commodity and service and product we buy, and eventually get to the point where we go back to what it was like from 2000 to 2008. That recently, John, Michigan had a totally open free market where anybody, anybody, could choose the electricity provider of their choice. Electricity rates in Michigan right now are the highest in the Midwest, 11th highest in the nation. They were higher than the national average before 2000 when people weren't free to choose. From 2000 to 2008 when everybody was free to choose, our electricity rates dropped below the national average. And then in 2008 when the legislature chose to give 90% of the market back to, see, to uh, consumers and DTE exclusively, our electricity rates since have gone back up above the national average. So I believe competition and choice is going to give us cheaper electricity rates. We have, an, we have a free choice state right next door in Ohio where six new power plants are currently being either constructed or permitted. And in Michigan, where we have two companies with a 90% monopoly, no power plants on the boards to be constructed except for Wolverine Power, on, which, uh, who, on whose board uh, leadership at Dow Chemicals sits. They're the only energy provider. They're an independent, non-utility energy company. They're building a new plant, uh, I think, next to Cadillac. And so they're the only people in the state talking about building the new energy capacity. So anyway, I think freedom of choice works uh, for electricity just like it does in the other aspects of our lives. But I'm going to I'm going to continue to do my best to provide leadership on that issue. It's a it's certainly a weighty substantive issue. I remember Andrew Liveris, CEO of Dow Chemical, gave a speech a couple of months ago that I attended. He only said, if I remember correctly, two sentences about energy policy. He said Dow Chemical is going to continue to locate business in Midland because it's part of our heritage. We're proud of it. But if you want to know why some of the 
plant projects we're putting in Houston aren't coming to Midland, give us more competitive energy rates and you'll get them. I thought that was pretty short and sweet. We've also been working very closely with Midland Co-Generation Venture. Uh, I don't think, as before I was a candidate, John, I didn't know this. I don't think most people in Midland even know that we have the largest gas-fired co-generation facility that makes electricity and steam for a lot of the functions at Dow Chemical, the largest plant like that in North America, the whole continent of North America, the biggest one is sitting out there right outside the city limits of Midland. And most people I think in Midland don't even know it's there. And uh, I have been working this week as well to try to stop a piece of legislation that would redefine turbines, turbines I mean the things that generate electricity, in such a way that it would result in a $1.8 million property tax increase on Midland Co-Generation Venture. If we're worried about building power plants in Michigan, we don't want to make it more expensive in terms of taxes for anybody who contemplates putting up an electricity plant that runs on a turbine. So I think it's self-defeating to our agenda of attracting new business and industry and job creation to Michigan and hopefully to mid-Michigan if we increase by 1.8 million the property taxes on the turbine that is used to generate the electricity. Uh, we passed this thing on the ballot in August of 2014, the personal property tax on business reduction right. for the purpose of making Michigan more attractive. This tax bill that I'm trying to stop uh, here in the, in the recent days that would increase the cost uh, in terms of taxes on electricity providers, that's going to make it less interesting, uh, cost more to invest in energy capacity and production in Michigan. So I'm going to oppose that as well. Representative, we're going to take a break right now, but there's plenty more to talk about. And we'll be back with Representative Gary Glenn reports right after this. And we're back with Representative Gary Glenn reports, you know, Representative faith-based adoption agencies, both historically and in the modern day, have played a very important role in our state and in our country when it comes to placing children in other states. The role of those agencies has been threatened. Here in Michigan, lawmakers have been working on legislation dealing with that issue, which actually just today as we record this, was signed into law That's right. by Governor Snyder. What, That's uh, right. what is that? It's a three-bill package. What does it do? And I can certainly consider that a victory for religious freedom. Uh, here in the state of Michigan, I was proud to be a co-sponsor of that legislation. The governor has signed it into law this morning as we're taping this today. Uh, and, and it does uh, pretty much a, one simple thing. It prohibits a government agency that's funded by taxpayers from discriminating against faith-based providers of adoption referral services. Only about a third of the adoption uh, agencies in the state of Michigan are faith-based, like Catholic Charities, Lutheran Community Services, Bethany Baptist Services. Um, and these are some services that, as a matter of sincere religious conviction, will refer children for adoption only to men and women, man and wife, uh, who are married as a matter of religious conviction. Catholic Charities will only refer, for example, a child to be adopted by a married mother and a father. They believe as a matter of religious conviction that's what's best for a child. I think social science indicates and common sense indicates that's what's best for a child, to have a mother and a father. Uh, we've got single moms who try their best to raise kids and we do everything we can to support them, but I don't think anybody would argue that in the ideal What's best is to have, you know, for a young teenage boy, to have a father in the home. Uh, we see a lot of social um, implications of that in, in communities that, where we have a high degree of fatherless homes. Uh, but to have, a, and for a young girl, to have a mother in the home. And, uh, and each, the, the mother and the father, both play a significant role in the raising of a child. And so... If you have a faith-based agency that says as a matter of conviction and principle, that's the only kind of referral we will make, it is unconstitutional for a government-funded entity like the state or a local government to put out a request for proposals or contracts to provide those kind of services and then say to a certain subset of the people who would respond to those requests for proposals, we will not do business with you because of your religious convictions. That is a clear case of what uh, is an established principle in constitutional law called content discrimination. 
It is precisely what you cannot do under the Constitution. And so this bill simply codifies the way the state of Michigan has operated for half a century in return in terms of uh, uh, adoption referral services provided by private providers to the state and local governments. We're simply protecting the way we've done business. Somebody who wants to adopt children in an environment other than a married mother and a father have got two-thirds of the adoption agencies in Michigan that are not faith-based. There is no lack of ability to find those kind of services. But uh, those who are opposed to this legislation presumably want the ability to try and force the faith-based adoption agencies to violate their religious convictions. So it's not only a matter of protecting the religious freedom of the faith-based adoption agencies, it's also a matter of uh, making sure this state as a tax-funded entity and political subdivisions like counties and cities do not violate constitutional First Amendment free speech and religious freedom rights by discriminating against faith-based providers of adoption referral services in a taxpayer finance request for proposals and contracts to provide that service. So it passed both the House and the Senate overwhelmingly with bipartisan support. I was a co-sponsor. The governor today signed it into law. That's a victory for Michigan taxpayers and a victory for religious freedom. I'm proud to have played a role in helping make that happen. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I have done is I'm introducing legislation to say that all state-funded institutions of higher education not only have access to electricity choice to save money and therefore hopefully reduce tuition, but also going to introduce legislation after I met with the Board of Trustees at Delta College to say that every tax-funded institution of higher learning in Michigan accepts the credits earned by students at any other taxpayer-funded institution of higher learning. The complaint was kids can go to Delta, can spend money, can expend the, you know, require the time and, and expenditure of money by the state-funded institution and the state-funded professors and then they want to transfer to Michigan State or Michigan and it, it won't transfer so you got to do it all over again they got to pay for the classes all over again and then use the time of the taxpayer funded professors you know to take the same class twice uh, so I'm going to do that tonight I've also been asked to serve on the advisory board of Midland Christian School uh, and that's got some uh, some uh, people of, of certainly uh, leadership positions in the in the community who are on that uh, Ron Beebe a CEO of uh, Euclid Industries is on the advisory committee. Uh, my opponent in the Republican primary last year, a leader in the local industry, uh, insurance industry, Carl Yeider, is also uh, on that uh, advisory committee, so I'm proud to do that. I'm going to be going tonight to a barbecue that's being hosted by Midland Christian School. And I did uh, recently have the privilege, uh, I'm an Eagle Scout, I have four Eagle Scout sons. I ran a campaign ad last year that talked about that, and so uh, that seemed to really strike a chord with people. Uh, the fact that I had four Eagle Scout sons, so I get many opportunities to speak, and I did most recently at a barbecue for St. Bridget Catholic in Midland where they had eight Eagle Scouts who were being recognized. Now that's a good flock of eagles. I think the old thing is that eagles are like leaders, you know, they are loners sometimes. You don't see a flock of eagles, but uh, we had eight Eagle Scouts uh, sponsored by the, that were uh, in the troop sponsored by St. Bridget. It was certainly my privilege uh, to congratulate them and welcome them into the fold of, of eagles, uh, having been one myself. So uh, do as much as I can to aggressively get to as many meetings as I can. I've heard on a number of occasions from township and school board officials and such that they appreciate how often I'm easily accessible and show up at their meetings to learn what kind of concerns they may have with what's going on in state government. I'm going to continue to do that. Um, my wife's going to tell me, I think I mentioned in an earlier program as I leave for Lansing uh, each week, Gary earned this. And so I'm going to continue to work hard and be responsible and dutiful as I can uh, to earn the privilege and responsibility of representing people in Bay and Midland counties to the best of my ability. Representative, thank you very much. Thank you, John. And I'm John Perry. Thank you for joining us.